I'll start by just telling you a little story that happened 10 days ago. Um, on the outskirts of Athens, a man was uh, arrested by the Greek police. Um, his name was Lasher, uh, and he was Georgian um, from Rustavi. Um, he has a, a nickname, uh, Lasher Tolsty, Fat Lasher. Um, and Lasher is a wanted man, um, a very wanted man in, uh, well, four different countries, in uh, Spain, Russia, France, and Georgia, for uh, a wide range of crimes. There's no red light on me. Um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, well, it is a wide range of crimes. I don't want to add any more to his list, but it's... Um, Money laundering, extortion, organize, organization of an armed group, um, membership of a criminal organization, uh, forgery, conspiracy to murder. <laughs> Literally, his criminal career is longer than my memory. Um, and the other thing about Lasher is that he is a thief-in-law. Um, and what does that mean to say that he's a thief-in-law? It's a strange thing to call him. Well, basically it means that Lasher has a, a criminal elite status. He's part of a network of criminal elite actors that become made men, mafia bosses. It's a post-Soviet um, phenomenon, a Soviet and post-Soviet phenomenon. Uh, it's also no coincidence that Lasher is Georgian um, as a thief-in-law because the thieves-in-law as mafia bosses, um, many of them come from Georgia. In fact, it's the most well-represented nationality of all the post-Soviet yeah. nationalities. Um, a third of all thieves-in-law come from Georgia, from such a small little place. Um, it also means that Lasher is the inheritor of a very rich criminal tradition. Uh, the thieves-in-law go way back to the Gulag, that's where they formed. Um, and it means that he, uh, you know, he's got something uh, to maintain. He has, uh, he has something to live up to. Uh, he has a name that he has to try to keep. Um, so, uh, basically, the problem is Greek police now, they could send him to a lot of different places, right? There's a lot of countries that want to get him. Um, and what does Lasher think about this? What does Lasher tell the Greek police? Well, Lasher says, uh, basically, guys, you can send me anywhere, just don't send me back to Georgia. <laughs> um, and basically, this presentation is about why did Lasher say that? Um, because it's a funny thing to say, because Georgia... Uh, if you've been here 10 years ago, was sort of the stronghold, it was the base, it was the nest of thieves-in-law, of these um, elite criminals. So why would Lasher now be saying, look, I don't want to go back there? What's changed? Um, and that's basically what the presentation is about. Um, to give you an example of what Georgia was like before the Rose Revolution in 2003, well, there was, uh, in June 2003, there were two... UN um, aid workers who were taken hostage in the Kadori Gorge in western Georgia. So, um, I think that most Georgians and most people know the silver fox on the left, that's um, Shevardnadze. So, to begin the, uh, the little anecdote again, you've got two aid workers who have been taken hostage in the Kadori Gorge in western Georgia. The Georgian government, led by Shevardnadze, they don't know, they can't do anything about it, they can't seem to get these guys back, they don't know how to negotiate their release. And so, the, the government representative in the gorge uh, appeals to the man on the right, which is Tarel Onyani, which I'm sure a lot of Georgians will know, who is one of the thieves-in-law, who is a big mafia uh, kingpin. And basically, Onyani gets the guys out of it. He releases the hostages, he does all the negotiations, and the Georgian government says, well, you know, we use this thief-in-law, yeah, you know, he helped us. Um, and Shevardnadze at the time isn't very happy about this, and in a parliamentary session he says, oh, you know, these thieves-in-law, they've eaten the country now. Um, so that's a little snapshot from uh, 2003. And Shevardnadze should know what he was talking about because he was invited back to head the country in 1992 by a thief-in-law who would help depose the first uh, um, elected uh, president of Georgia, Zuyed Gamsakhurdia. Uh, that's the man on the left here, uh, Jabi Osiliani, who was also a thief-in-law. So Shevardnadze had been inv invited back to Georgia by a thief-in-law. So we can see the level that these guys had reached in Georgian society and politics. And it was really, you know, just a strong opinion that Georgian thieves-in-law were not only just big business sort of organized criminals, 
they were deeply embedded in Georgian society and Georgian culture, and there was something about um, the way that they lived, uh, that they had a code of honor, which is the law part of their name, which was anti-materialist, and that, that how somehow was congruous with Georgian cultural values, and that, that made it very difficult for any sort of fight against them, that they were somehow so deeply embedded in Georgian culture that it would be very difficult to uproot them. But then if we fast forward um, about, what, to 2005, 2006, we've got a new government, Shevardnadze's gone, Saakashvili's in, and uh, they started an anti-mafia campaign, which they, I mean, it came basically from Italy. Uh, they borrowed a lot of ideas from Italy. The mayor of Palermo, a man called Leo Luca Orlando, came over many times to advise on this. Uh, he was a, an anti-mafia campaigner himself, and he'd, he'd actually been in Soviet Georgia in the 1980s when he'd had a threat to his life. Um, and he'd really enjoyed it, you know, he really liked Georgia, he said, you know, Sicily and Georgia, they've got so much in common. Um, and so he came out, you know, and, and advised the government, and he basically said there's a two-wheeled cart of, maf of anti-mafia reform. Um, so a cart needs two wheels to be going at the same time in order to move forward, and the same thing's true of an anti-mafia reform, according to Orlando. He said you need to have police reform and legislation which directly hits the mafia, and you need to have a sort of cultural reform, a grassroots uh, educational reform to try to uh, break the link between social positive values which support the mafia. Um, and the Georgian government basically took up a lot of the, the, the advice. They passed anti-mafia laws which directly targeted thieves in law. Um, they created some concepts about educating for legality. Uh, they started to confiscate assets. Here, this is a house in, uh, in Tilavi, uh, which used to belong to a thief in law and is now uh, belongs to the Georgian police. Uh, here's, a, here's another one in Kutaisi. Um, this one's quite interesting because the, the police told me to hear that this house at the top, you can see there's a little room right at the top there. Uh, and he said that was intended basically for the thieves in law to get together when they would initiate a new man into their criminal fraternity. Uh, they would let the, uh, the neighborhood know by uh, releasing smoke from a chimney at the top in imitation of the Vatican. Um, now, I don't think you actually have to believe that story for it to be interesting because what it shows is that the people who live in Kutaisi, which was basically the main stronghold, it was the Palermo of Georgia, um, it basically means that the, the, those people look at the thieves-in-law and they thought, well, those guys thought they were so untouchable that this story actually started to be believed. People actually thought this. So they said, you know, I, I think it shows that people in Kutaisi believed, well, this mafia is so untouchable. Um, you know, they actually believe what the Pope believes, that they're infallible, basically. Um, so, it's an interesting anecdote. And in terms of the anti-mafia reform, how successful it's been, we can see uh, this is some research that was done in 2010, uh, the perceptions of success. And you see 70% of people saying uh, that the influence of the thieves-in-law has significantly decreased, 6% saying that it, it's actually been eliminated. Uh, so the perception is that, you know, this Georgian anti-mafia reform really worked but this sort of sets up a bit of a puzzle because if we think, well, these, these mafia guys, they were so um, strong that they, you know, they were really deeply embedded in Georgian society, yet within a few years, this new government managed to eliminate them or at least significantly decrease their influence. How, do, how does that work? Um, and so in order to answer that question, when we're thinking about influence of organized crime groups or, and mafias, um, I think it's the, the, what we need to do is go back to, well, in order to understand their influence, how influential they were in the first place and the, then the decline of that influence, we need to think about exactly what the Mafia was, was doing. So what were the thieves-in-law doing? What was their function? Uh, well, what is the function of Mafias generally? Basically, Mafias act like states. Uh, that is, they provide protection um, and dispute resolution, arbitration, and that's what the thieves-in-law were doing. Um, and so basically what I'm going to argue now is that the thieves-in-law, they had uh, a criminal brand name uh, and a reputation for dispute resolution and protection, and there was a big demand for their services in Georgia. So, um, and this is what actually gave rise to their influence. So if we start with the demand, the demand for their services, which is protection and dispute resolution, um, where would that demand come from? Well, in the Soviet period, what we know is there was a massive second economy which built up in the 70s and 80s. People were engaged in entrepreneurial activity, which was illegal, 
And just the very fact that the, the state was so, so strong and had criminalized so many different areas of activity, it meant that if two people were trading and there was a dispute between them, well, they couldn't turn to the state for, uh, to, uh, for dispute resolution. They couldn't go to a, a civil court or an arbitra arbitration court. So they would have to turn to uh, alternative providers of that protection. And the thieves in law, of course, were a good, uh, well, a, a re re reputable company that could help you out. Um, and then in the post-Soviet period, instead we actually find that, okay, now capitalist uh, activities are all legalized, but now the state's too weak to actually enforce any laws, the court system's collapsed. So again, you have the same dilemma. You want to transact with somebody, you can't trust the other person. So, you know, how do you, how do you resolve that issue? Again, well, you can turn to your alternative dispute res uh, resolver, that is the thieves-in-law in this case. But then we shouldn't necessarily think that people would necessarily or... Um, through necessity, actually turn to the thieves-in-law. Why turn to the thieves-in-law? Why not turn to somebody else? Or why not just, you know, not engage in any transactions whatsoever? There are other options available. Um, so what was it about the thieves-in-law that allowed them to become very prominent in these markets, and therefore in Georgian society generally? Well, my argument is, I mean, I would never get a job in advertising, but, you know, if I had to create a little advert for the thieves-in-law, this is what it would be. Uh, basically, my argument is that I mean, they were, they were a brand name, like, like Nike or Prada. Um, you know, what, what do we know about brand names? Well, in the first place, you know, they've, uh, they've got a long history. They go back to the 1930s, and, well, that's a sort of sig sig a signal of quality, a signal of uh, your, um, the fact that you know what you're doing, you're reliable. You know, you've been doing this for a long time. Um, the second thing is you've got a, you've got a, a trademark. I mean, this is a criminal market, right? You can't, it's not these guys don't have an address in the phone book or, a, or in the yellow pages. You can't just look up their services. So you need, they need some other way to let people know they're there. And they've got this nice uh, criminal trademark, which is this star, the black and white eight-pointed star, which thieves-in-law wear as tattoos on their shoulders and on their knees. Uh, obviously, they don't have copyright laws in the criminal world. So uh, they have to protect, protect their trademark in another way, which is usually just by killing people. Um, so you wouldn't want to wear these tattoos unless you really were a thief-in-law. Uh, and the third thing that the, the thieves-in-law could, you know, actually promote their own brand is um, they're a franchise, right? So they operate across the whole country. Um, you, know, thief, you're, you, are, you become a thief-in-law, you buy into a collective reputation, uh, and you have to meet a certain standard. You have to sit for many years in prison and live by their code of honor, etc., etc. Um, so in some ways you might think that, uh, you know, the the, uh, the thieves-in-law are to post-Soviet organized crime what uh, McDonald's are to hamburgers and what TED is to public speaking events. Um, so, uh, you know, so the mafia, you know, they need to maintain this reputation. It's important that if you've got this franchise, you need to make sure that everybody's at the right standard to make sure that your reputation on this market is, uh, is, is good and people actually want to use your services. So what we see all over the world is that mafias actually spend time and effort in um, promoting themselves and making sure that they actually have a positive reputation in the societies they operate within. Uh, so you see this, for example, in Sicily with the Cosa Nostra. They invest and they, uh, in, in St. Days, they'll put on a feast for the whole village. Uh, in Colombia, the Medellin cartel, uh, they paid for housing projects, hospitals, churches. And um, Pablo Escobar, who was a, a ruthless killer, was also known as a compassionate philanthropist. Um, so, uh, and in Georgia, we see the same thing. Um, the thieves-in-law are very keen to cultivate the idea that these guys were similar to churchmen, similar to uh, the, the men of the cloth, uh, ascetic, anti-materialistic. Uh, and as an example of that, here's a, a church that was built with thief-in-law thief -in money uh, in Kutaisi, a little church on the River Rione, and I would just call this, is, this is advertising to the, the Kutaisi society uh, about what such great guys these were. Um, and here we have, uh, again, the Kutaisi guys. Uh, here, here they're at um, the Galati Monastery. All right? I'm sure people have recognized that. It's, the, it's a nice uh, monastery complex outside Kutaisi. Um, so they were keen to draw their um, close connections with the church because it helps for their reputation in society. So again, this helped them to embed themselves in Georgian society. But the problem is, if it's a franchise and you allow people to join your franchise, you allow people to take on this name, you recruit them, you initiate them, 
then you need to make sure that, that they are actually at the right standard. And if it's a mafia group, it means these guys have to be proper, strong criminals. They know what they're doing. Um, and that's the same in every franchise, right? There are, you need to meet certain standards, like Ted requires me to speak with no notes, for example. Um, so, the problem is, though, what we know about the thieves in law is that their recruitment practices at some point just started to go awry. Um, people became recruited without prison experience. Some people just bought the title. Uh, and this is exemplified by the case of this young man here, who um, he became a thief in law in 1999. Um, I'm not writing his biography, I just know quite a lot about this. And uh, he. Um, he, he basically became a thief in law because his dad was a thief in law. He'd never been in prison, he'd never committed any crimes. Um, in fact, the first time he was convicted of a crime was in 2008 when he stole a bottle of vodka from a Mos uh, Moscow supermarket. So, it, you know, this, isn't, um, this is hardly uh, Tony Soprano, right? This isn't, um, uh, this isn't a really, uh, I don't know, big name uh, criminal boss like Lasher actually is. Uh, so the, the problem is that at some point these re the recruitment practices broke down and that had an effect on the, the, the standard of the, the trademark, the reputation. Um, and so why? Why would that happen? Well, uh, this picture basically sums it up. Here's a couple of thieves-in-law out and about in Paris. Um, and basically the problem is that it's the 1990s when the Soviet Union collapses, everybody's getting rich, right? So these guys are thinking, well, I want to get rich too. And now the borders are open and I can go and get rich in... Costa del Sol, or Paris, or Moscow. So these guys who are from Georgia just go off and go about their business. Now, why, why would they care if uh, the criminal practices and recruitment practices in Georgia are not really working and they're not recruiting the, the right level of candidate for the job? Well, uh, they don't, basically. They're just getting rich, so why would they care? Uh, and this actually maybe helps to explain these changes in the post-Soviet period help, help us to understand uh, how the thieves-in-law actually became, well, their reputation started to wane within Georgian society because they stopped being honorable men and just became what Georgians think of as a mafia, which is basically in it for the money and corrupt, just like the rest of Georgian institutions at that time. So this maybe helps us to understand why the anti-mafia campaign uh, was successful, not just because the policy was so strong, but also because uh, the mafia themselves were somehow changing. Um, so, just to make a final um, comment, well, my time's up. Uh, when we talk about uh, mafias around the world, there's mafias in all sorts of places, uh, especially in weak states, usually poor countries. Um, we usually say, oh, you know, it's somehow it's, it's culturally defined, it's preordained that these countries have to live with these mafia groups. Uh, it's something to do with, uh, you know, I don't know, backward culture or attitudes and their respect for criminal mentality and their anti-modern values. They don't like the rule of law. Um, but what does the Georgian experience show us? Well, I think it shows us that the mafia is propagating its own myth. It wants you to believe that it's very, very powerful, and we all buy into it. We all love buying the, the movies and, and the reading about it. You know, that's why I'm here now, right? But, um, but what it shows, I think, is in Georgia... You know, you could have said the same thing 10 years ago, that it was just a, a sort of preordained destiny that, you know, history and culture determined the fact that Georgia would have to deal with this sort of organized criminals. Um, but what's actually happened is it might still be not entirely won yet, but that battle is quite close to being won, I would suggest. And uh, so in Georgia, we could see that the destiny in, in Georgia's case is actually reversible. Um, and that should serve as, as, as a positive model for other, other parts of the world. Thank you.